Next idea we're going to be studying is energy and metabolism. So go ahead and jot this down. We're going to be studying this for quite a while. And this is just uh, going to give you some introductory information about the language that we use when we talk about cellular energy, metabolism, and the different processes that create energy and use energy. Okay, so we have to remember what these words mean. Autotroph, heterotroph, metabolism. Hope remember autotroph uh, means self-feeding. These are plants. Uh, and algae and some bacteria that can create their own sugars doing photosynthesis or something else called chemosynthesis. Heterotrophs are those that need to ingest sugars by eating other organisms. And metabolism may be one that you've forgotten, so if you did, write this down. This is the sum of all chemical reactions in the cell. It's a very generic definition, but one that we really have to understand. Metabolism is actually broken down in two parts. There's anabolism, and sometimes you hear it called anabolic reactions. Those, that's the part of metabolism, or those are the metabolic reactions in a cell that make molecules. That requires energy. So like building muscle, growing larger, uh, making a glucose molecule in photosynthesis. Those are all anabolic reactions, and they require energy. Catabolism, or a catabolic reaction, that's the part of metabolism where molecules are broken down and that's going to release energy. Right now, hopefully we've all had breakfast or lunch or dinner depending on when you're watching this and you're doing some catabolic processes of digestion. You're taking polysaccharides and breaking them down into monosaccharides. You're taking lipids and breaking that glycerol and those three fatty acid chains apart. You're breaking peptide bonds and polypeptides and making amino acids. That's all catabolic reactions and those make energy. ATP, we've mentioned, but we never really talked about it yet. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. That's the A, the T, and the P. And we're going to draw it very diagrammatically here. So draw this in your notes. Uh, the adenosine molecule, we really aren't too concerned about the structure of that because that's not what's really storing the energy for us or releasing the energy. Uh, a phosphate group we've talked about quite a bit with phospholipids. They had a phosphate head. Uh, we talked about this with um, the phosphorus cycle. And here's another reason why our cells need phosphorus is to make these phosphates, to hook them together to make this thing called adenosine triphosphate. This is an energy storage molecule. This is a very temporary type of storage because it's very unstable. Uh, our bodies make this and then seconds later break it down. This is like the cell's gasoline. Uh, the way that we get the energy out of this is that this third bond gets broken. When that third bond breaks, this phosphate here is able to kind of break off. And it's still there, but it's just in the vicinity. It's no longer attached. And then we get adenosine diphosphate. So when we break this thing down and release the energy out of it, we make a... DP. I'm writing with a mouse here, that's why it looks so sloppy. But ATP, which charged up, ready to release some energy. When you break that bond, remember that is a catabolic reaction to break that bond. Then it's called ADP, and you get this phosphate. But you've released energy once you've broken this molecule down. Thinking of ATP like gas in a car is a really good analogy. Uh, a car can really do nothing without gasoline in it. Uh, even the battery won't work after a while if there's no gas in the car because the car actually charges the battery by running the gasoline part of the engine. Same thing with our cells. We need ATP for everything. Uh, everything that an organism does that requires energy, that energy is the ATP. And every time we use one ATP molecule, like we said, we break off that third phosphate, Breaking that bond is catabolic and releases energy, and we're left with ADP and a phosphate, which is kind of like um, your Chromebook battery when it's out of energy. Okay, it's still there; it's just uncharged now. Okay, uh, examples of how our cells use ATP: there are probably millions of them, but some ones that we can think of and we've heard of. Every time you move a muscle, you're using a tremendous amount of ATP, even to blink your eyes. Uh, we talked about active transport. I uh, would have that sodium potassium pump. 
how it needs ATP to plug in the side there to allow those ions to go against their concentration gradients. That's active transport, requires ATP. For a cell to grow, that's also going to require a tremendous amount of ATP. So ATP is the cell's energy, and we're going to really get into how cells make this, use it over the next few weeks. I love this picture, and let me take you through it really quickly. Up here, here's our ATP. So right here, we have the adenosine with the triphosphate. Okay, We're going to go down the left-hand side, we're going to counterclockwise on this thing. We break off that last phosphate, this little explosion here is showing you energy that's available for the cell to use. So this explosion can do the active transport, it can let your muscles move, or whatever the cell needed this energy for. All right, so here's this catabolic process, and we're left with ADP. So I'll try to write here again, ADP, and this phosphate here. This is like a dead battery. Okay, it can be charged up again, but right now you can't break another phosphate off and get more energy. It's just not the way it works in our cells. So this is like a dead battery, but we can recharge it again. And if you look up here, uh, going from 6 o'clock here back up to noon on this figure, you see we can put these together. If we add energy to it, we can recreate the bond and make the ATP again. Well, recreating that bond, that would be an anabolic process. That's going to require energy. So a logical question is, where am I going to get that energy from? How do I put that phosphate back on there? Well, the way that our cells do it is by breaking down molecules and foods that we eat. Okay, the main one would be glucose. So glucose is what plants make when they do photosynthesis. And we're going to learn about a process called cellular respiration. That's going to tell us how we take one glucose and break it down to generate 36 ATP. And the way we generate them is by putting this phosphate back on some ADP, and then we make this again, and then it's immediately used again. Okay, So we keep going through this process of making the ATP, doing some cellular work, dead battery, using molecules from foods that we eat, or autotrophs can use this glucose that they're making, and then recharge this ATP molecule. So this is constantly occurring in living cells. It would make sense that you would think, hey, I go to sleep and I store up all the ATP I need for the next day, but that's just not the way it works. ATP, you don't store it in a cell. It's too unstable. That, lo that last phosphate would break off almost spontaneously, and you don't need energy being released spontaneously in your body. So we really don't store ATP in our cells. Uh, I looked up a stat that we normally have enough ATP to last seconds, probably less than 10 seconds. So we don't store ATP, but what we do is we store the raw materials to make the ATP. And you guys know this. We store carbs. We store it as glycogen. Plants store carbs as starch. We also store, store lipids. We store body fat. Plants can store different oils and things like that. And then when we need extra ATP, we'll break down those carbs in our bodies, we'll break down those fats in our bodies, and we'll use that energy to combine the ADP with the phosphate to make the ATP as we need it. This is really the secret to weight loss. If people want to use, use up the fats on their body to decrease their body weight, well, they have to use more energy, so they exercise more. Well, okay, so that's making your body use more ATP, which then forces your body to combine more ADP with some phosphates, and the energy comes from that by breaking down sugars and fats. When people are dieting, they try to avoid eating carbs and fats because you don't want to use what you're eating to fuel this thing. You want what's on your body to be used to combine those ADPs and those phosphates to make the ATP. So uh, hopefully this weight loss example helps you understand you know, what we're talking about here. And my little analogy here is the Earth doesn't store energy as gasoline. It's stored as oil, that crude oil, which is a fossil fuel. So gasoline uh, can be very combustible, very reactive. That's kind of like the ATP. 
The Earth stores its energy, its fossil fuels as oil, just like we store our energy as fats and carbs. And then we take the fats and carbs and convert them into the ATP, just like we as humans realize we could take the oil and convert it into gasoline. Okay, so we mentioned this already, and this is a review of the biochemistry. And this is why it's good to pay attention and review these things. Uh, carbs and lipids are very high in energy, and the re and that's why we use them to make the ATP. And this right here should say ADP. So take a minute and jot any of this stuff down that you need. A little, a little review of the lipids here. Uh, these are our fats, oils, waxes, and steroids. These are very high energy compounds, and we break those down to make ATP as well. Uh, lipids can store more energy than the carbs. If you remember the structure of the lipid with that glycerol and those fatty acid chains, you had all those bonds. Well, all of those can be broken to release energy. There's a lot more bonds in a lipid than there is in a carb, and that's why they carry so much more energy that we can catabolize to use that energy to build up those ATP molecules as our body demands it. So, little review here of the biochem. Single sugar molecules right here, monosaccharides. Large carbs form from linking of those monosaccharides. Those are the polysaccharides that would go right here. We and other animals store extra sugar in a polysaccharide called glycogen. And plants store extra carbs in a polysaccharide called starch. So you're responsible for this stuff. We're going to be mentioning these words again. And it's just good to review these things. All right, a few processes we're going to be learning about. Uh, first off will be photosynthesis. And secondly, we'll be studying respiration. Here's the equation for photosynthesis. Uh, remember that we have reactants on the left, and we should have an arrow here pointing to these products over here on the right. And forget about the, the chemical formulas here, but we take carbon dioxide and water, and we need light, so that's an energy source. We write that over the arrow, and that produces sugar. This is our glucose and oxygen. So plants are doing this, algae are doing this, and some bacteria are doing this. They do this in their chloroplast if they're eukaryotes. Well, plants don't just stop right here, because remember, we said that no living thing runs off sugar. So plants, they do this in their chloroplast, and then they have to do this down here called respiration in their mitochondria. So you guys always learn mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. This is what that means. Take in the glucose. If you're a plant or an algae, you take it from your chloroplast and you move it over here to your mitochondria. If you're a heterotroph, you eat this glucose and you breathe this oxygen in. If you're a plant, you have your own oxygen and you have your own sugar because you use sunlight to make all this stuff. And that produces CO2, which is a waste product. We breathe that right out. Plants and algae and things, they can reuse that right up here again in the photosynthesis. We make water, which our bodies can use. Again, if you're photosynthetic, uh, you would use that right over here back in your chloroplasts. But this is the whole point of the cellular respiration, is to make the ATP. We're taking one form of energy, the glucose. We're doing a process in our mitochondria that requires oxygen, and we're making ATP. That's the energy that our cells run on. So we're spending a lot of time on both of these processes, looking at which cells do them and how cells do them. But just remember that photoautotrophs have to do photosynthesis in their chloroplast, move the products to their mitochondria to get the ATP out. We as heterotrophs, we eat our glucose, we breathe in our oxygen, and we make our ATP that way. So obviously feel free to rewind, watch any parts of this video that you need to watch again, and uh, ask many questions that you need.